This is the game Cybermorph. If you're familiar with it, it's probably because you've seen the angry video game nerd episode where he spends five minutes playing it and falls into a drunken hallucination. That's this game's biggest claim to fame, as both it and the console it was packaged with, the Atari Jaguar, sold less than 150,000 units. Uh, I want you to keep that in mind when I read this excerpt. <clears throat> After playing Cybermorph, I emerge, totally fulfilled, with the strange feeling that after playing video games for nine years, I had just played the first real one. All 3D, all rendering on the fly, filled with vivid, brilliant colors and detailed polygon enemies that seem aware of my presence. The face of gaming has totally changed. Look at the creativity, the sound, the intelligence. Cybermorph has great music in the intro, but the game itself whispers only the surreal sounds of each planet. The sounds of the approaching missiles, the rumbling of approaching transport vehicles, the hum of your thrusters. That's all you hear, and rightfully so. Music would only interfere. Support? They will have it. Because we will all own this system. Atari is back. Come pet the cat. Where did you learn to be an asshole? Now, if I told you that this is a review from a nationally syndicated gaming magazine in 1994, you might chuckle to yourself and say, what, did this guy write this on acid? <laughs> Wait, that was a joke. That was, where are you serious? Methods by which Dave Halverson was brought into the world are obscure, but in the beginning, there was a mullet. It is likely that he was born around 1959, and at some point got into the business of used car sales. Dave was a shrewd man, by some definition, and possessed an unstoppable willpower. When he had a dream, he would realize it, even if the car he sold was running on empty. Yes, to enter the mayhem. The glimmer of Game Fan began as a business Dave ran with his girlfriend Julie called Die Hard Gamers Club, located in the Los Angeles suburb of Tarzana, California. This was a retail and mail order store, notable for being a rare gold mine for Japanese import games when it was founded in 1990. In 1992, Dave approached an acquaintance of his, Tim Lindquist, with his goal of turning the game club into a full-fledged magazine, after Dave had an apparent falling out with Electronic Gaming Monthly. With gall in his step and a self-admitted naive outlook, Tim agreed and began working full-time for Dave as a graphic designer. We hadn't agreed on what my salary would be yet, so I told Dave what I'd need to survive, and he said, Sure, no problem. Then, the next day, he didn't show up for work. Julie came to me and said Dave was deathly ill, and she didn't know when he'd be back to work. So I decided to just start designing sections. At the end of the week, I asked Julie if she'd be giving me my paycheck. She said something like, Oh, well, Dave talked to Andy, the money guy, and he doesn't want to pay you, so Dave wants to know if you'll take a percentage ownership of the magazine instead, and we'll just give you whatever extra money we can get out of our pockets, like uh, whenever you need some money. Dave would return to work on Monday. Whew! Glad we didn't lose him to that mystery illness. He must have really strengthened his immune system too, because I don't recall him taking a sick day for the next 12 months straight. Making a magazine is no simple task, and setting yourself apart in the market is even harder. 
but the emerging die-hard game fan would cut its own way against the competition. Game fan had an attitude no one else could measure up to. It comes bursting out in the visuals that seep from every corner. Check out this awesome intro! Who else would hype up Wonder Dog like that? Some of the graphic design hurts my eyes, but I can't deny the truly different and striking layouts that were present from day one. GameFan was notable for having high quality screenshots at a time when most other mags were just photographing the screen directly. This could be owed to Tim Lindquist. We started off with some really horrible composite video capture hardware. The quality of shots in issue 1 was piss poor, but I knew from my experience hacking the Genesis and Neo Geo into arcade cabinets with RGB monitors, that if I could find a screen capture card with RGB input, we'd be able to grab near pixel perfect shots and trounce EGM and the others. The new tech caused a frenzy, and you can tell, Issue 2 is stuffed to the brim with images showing what other magazines couldn't. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Let's roll back to September 1992, when the first ever issue was being assembled. The staff is nine strong. Dave Halverson, Greg Off, Maz Kagita, Jay Perrier, Kay Kaboki, Tim Lindquist, George Weising, Julie Anderson, and Dave Winding. Writers, editors, graphic designers, the only thing missing was an artist. George Weising comes in one morning and announces that he was at a game store and met a guy who did artwork for Heavy Metal Magazine. Everyone jumps at the opportunity to work with a guy like that, and Terry Wolfinger strolls into the office a few days later. He fibs a little that he's done airbrush before, and they give him a test assignment. On his way home, he picks up a how to airbrush guide and starter kit. After some practice, he started work on the actual assignment. This just so happened to be the weekend he was scheduled to go sand wheeling with his family. As luck would have it, my first day out riding, I get a piece of sand caught in my eye and scratch my cornea all up to hell. After coming back from the hospital, I now have to complete my three projects with an eye patch on. Arr. So what else can go wrong? Well, I managed to make it through, and the three projects came out surprisingly well. The rest of the staff were busy with their noses to the grindstone to get the first issue done by the deadline. As Terry returns Monday morning with the finished work, they look it up and down, decide he's right for the job, and add, Hey, uh, we're gonna do the cover, uh, by, like, tonight. Terry, frantically, pulls an all-nighter to get the piece done, and delivers it to the office just as the sun is coming up. With his eye patch still on, he begins the drive home and falls asleep at the wheel. I changed a full lane on the freeway before waking back up and nearly hitting a motorhome. And that was the beginning of my game fan career. These early issues were printed at Tim's former employer, TV Fanfare in Valencia, California. Jay would drive around in his pickup truck and give copies away to whoever would take them. These humble beginnings are a good indication for the vibe of Game Fan. By issue 3, they'd been picked up by a publisher for national distribution, but a certain garage band style stuck for its lifetime. Nintendo Life interviewed a few former GF staffers in 2021, and one of them, Molly Patterson, had this to say. Writing for Game Fan was like having a conversation about video games with a friend, where you'd gush about the latest game you'd played that they really needed to also try, or have fun trashing some new title that was just a piece of junk. While the staff was a huge assortment of people from very different backgrounds, Nearly everyone who worked there had that same passion for gaming. Working there also helped cement beliefs I still hold to this day, such as how games should always be judged on their own merits, or how those of us in the media should always strive to be at least moderately skilled in as many genres as possible. The Die Hard wasn't for nothing. In later years, the magazine would adopt the tagline, The Last True Enthusiast Magazine. 
It was by gamers for gamers. Staff members would go by pseudonyms that came with exaggerated characters drawn by Wolfinger himself. They had names like Tom Slick, Glitch, and Nightmare. Halverson's character, E. Storm, was always depicted with his trademark mullet. Around the office, Dave would be known as 1090. 10% 10 in the front, 90% in the back. Yeah. Yes. Wolfinger also illustrated a comic that would appear frequently called The Adventures of Monitar, starring the magazine's mascot. At a time when more and more gaming mags were turning towards cleaner, more minimalist designs, GameFan was blasting you with text and images crammed into every inch. We were young and crazy, but also had a passion for this magazine we loved. In these early days, Tim would do very little writing, as he and George were the only ones on the staff who actually knew how to type. This meant that the writers would stand around the two of them at their computers and dictate their reviews like medieval lords. When reflecting on their time at GameFan, many of the contributors choose to appreciate the good over the bad, but there was bad, and its root was Dave Halverson. The story of Halverson and the antics under him is long and winding, much of it recollected in various forums by former staff. Thankfully, this history has been condensed into a single page on Hardcore Gaming 101 by a Hey, it's you! John Shapanyuk. I pronounced it right this time. I hope. Many years later, in a forum populated with several game fan alumni, Dave appeared to promote another project of his, only to be lit up by Molly Patterson, known in the magazine as Shidoshi. Halverson had a reputation for acting... unscrupulously. Molly claims he threatened to fire her because she'd dyed her hair, deeming it unpresentable when Molly wasn't the one meeting with representatives in the first place. More accusations were added that Dave would give or take credit for writing, steal packages, and give game copies meant for staff to friends and family. At one point, there was a four-way power struggle between some staffers, which resulted in three of them ganging up on one named Greg. They told Dave that Greg had been stealing merchandise from Game Club and had a stash in his apartment. One of the people in this cabal happened to be Greg's roommate, so Dave tells him to give them the key, and then Julie and one other person go to raid Greg's apartment while Greg is out. When Greg got back to the office, he found almost all of his earthly possessions rifled through and strewn about, with many of them missing. It turns out he was completely innocent, and he never got back a lot of items that had personal value to him. There was a general lack of care in the office. One infamous story began when they received an early review copy of Resident Evil 2. It got into the hands of one Andrew Cockburn, who, no pun intended, burned it. Two days later, the president of Capcom Japan finds out that there's a copy of the game floating around somewhere in Southern California, and he is not happy. They track it down to a used game store and find out that it was a review copy meant for one very specific publication. Federal marshals raid the game fan offices. According to Matt Van Stone, known as Kodomo in the magazine, it took two years for Capcom to be comfortable giving them any kind of review copy, and when they did, they would be standing outside the room waiting for them to finish playing it. This isn't the only story surrounding Andrew Cockburn, actually. Uh, supposedly, authorities came to the game fan offices one day looking for him because he had acquired a fake ID under the name Guile? As in Guile from Street Fighter. Because what else? <laughs> He then used this ID to get a passport so he could take a trip to Japan. 
Sometime later, the police would again show up to the game fan offices looking for Cockburn's boss. When they met Dave, they asked him whether or not Andrew is, quote, a good, hard-working kid or a drugged-out, acid-dropping nut job. So Dave vouches for Andrew, says, no, he's a good, hard-working kid, and he asks, you know, what the meaning of all this is. Apparently, on his way to work that morning, Andrew had struck a female jogger while he was making a right turn, looking left for traffic. She filed a police report, but because Dave put in a good word for Andrew, the cops just told her that it was her fault, and she should have been more careful. <laughs> Naturally, this interrogation went down before the group acid trip. Oh yeah, you remember the Cybermorph view from the start of the video? So, according to Tim, the staff had been pulling back-to-back all-nighters, and when Cockburn came into work the next morning, he just so happened to drop some LSD into the office coffee pot. And I'm not talking about the game. I wasn't a coffee drinker at the time, so I didn't really notice anything unusual and didn't learn what was going on until George started threatening to murder Cockburn. This was actually a regular occurrence. The all-nighters, not the acid. See, Dave had this really interesting management style where he wouldn't let anyone do anything until he told them to. Now, this wouldn't be so bad if he didn't wait uh, two and a half weeks or more to start handing out assignments every month. So games would come in for the month and Dave would spend his time playing them in his office and doing whatever while everyone else did pretty much the same thing amongst themselves. Then when he was good and ready, he'd tell everyone what they had to do and to make sure that the games he liked got top billing that month while the other staff would work feverishly with often only a week to get the entire magazine ready. And these weren't short affairs either. Lots and lots of these issues are close to or over 200 pages. A good portion of that is ad space, but still, that's a lot of content to fill. The bad planning led to work regularly coming in late, which delayed the printing, and now late fees start rolling in from the printing company, and these would build up and up and up, and then Dave would just drop them like a rock and jump to another one. Eventually, not a single local printer would take them because their reputation was so bad. I don't know if Dave skipped his payments because he was cheap or because they were broke, but either way, the poor management extended to the company's finances as well. Tim Lindquist recalls that Halverson began hunting for investors only six or seven months into the magazine's life. The revenue from ads wasn't cutting it, and the original investor, a guy named Andy Fell, was losing money. Dave reached out to everybody, including employees and their families. According to Tim, he got at least three people to invest somewhere between fifty and sixty thousand dollars. Wolfinger claims that his own father invested thirty thousand alone for a profit sharing percentage that never happened. Don't think for a second that Dave Halverson was not living it up, mind you. None of those investors ever saw a single dollar back from him, but Dave did show up on a brand new motorcycle paid for in cash. In Terry's words, how does one sleep at night doing the shit he did? In 1996, Game Fan was purchased by a publisher called Metropolis Media, owned by a man named Dave Bergstein. Another Dave. Perfect. Magazine publishing can be a notoriously shady business. See, publishers make money off of sales to stores and news racks. The sale of the book itself goes to the actual store. This leads to a lot of opportunistic businessmen who want to get in, push as much product as possible, and get out. Bergstein was no different, and his arrival on the scene signaled a change in the way that people got paid. I'll let Shidoshi explain. What would happen is, as payday was a day or two away, we would call the bank to see if there was money in the back to actually make the paychecks worth something. It was pretty sad that we knew by heart the phone number for the bank and the account number for Metropolis Media. Maybe twice a year on payday, the full amount to pay everyone was in there. More often than not, there would only be about half of the required amount in there. 
The moment checks were handed out, everybody would run out to their cars and cannonball run style race to the closest branch of that bank to cash the checks. If you got there too late, you were out of luck. The remainder of the money to cover the paychecks might come the next day, or it might not come for a few days. I think once or twice, it even took a week or so to get in there, if not longer. There were times, though, that no money was in there at all on payday, so everybody in the office simply had worthless pieces of paper. We'd then have to just call every day to find out when we could actually get some money. When the feds raided the offices for Capcom, Shidoshi assumed that it was an IRS audit, which is not shocking at all. This herky-jerky financial management would be the breaking point for some of the original members of the game fan lineup. One of the people Dave managed to con into investing was a beauty salon owner by the name of Elaine Shings. Tim mentions a rumor that she put in as much as $70,000 but he doesn't know for sure. Regardless, she put in a lot of money, and she wanted a position as office manager and control of the checkbook. At this point, the staff was racing to the bank while Dave bought fancy new neon signs and custom embroidered jackets, so the idea of having someone new at the helm of the finances was reassuring. Well, no more than two or three weeks after Elaine started working in the office, Jay came round to tell everyone not to cash their paychecks quite yet. He said that Halverson had broken into Elaine's desk, taken the checkbook, and bought a three-foot Sonic the Hedgehog statue with the payroll money. So we should wait until Elaine said it was okay to cash checks. <laughs> this was not the first time he would do this. A later employee, known as Waka, recalls an instance where nobody was paid for three months at a time, while the Daves were cashing their checks first. I remember when Halverson got into Jay's office to steal his and Julie's paycheck so they could cash them ahead of us. When he was confronted about it, his words were, quote, I don't care. Throw another body on the fire for all I care. Well, when the three-foot Sonic statue incident happened, Tim, quote, got the sinking feeling that Halverson was the devil himself, and I had better tie up some loose ends that had gone unresolved for far too long. If you recall, uh, Tim Lindquist was promised a percentage ownership in the company when they couldn't offer him a paycheck. Well, Andy, the original investor and money guy, was supposed to draft up these papers and everything would be taken care of. A few months pass and no papers. Tim asks Dave about it and Dave says, Oh yeah, he needs lawyers for that. It's a slow process. Don't worry about it. Don't worry. Do you see where this is going? This song and dance goes on for about 12 months when the TFSS incident happened and Tim rightfully gets suspicious about where all the money is going. He starts asking around and writing down what he hears, and he finds out that if you added up everything that Dave promised to everyone, he had given away over a hundred percent of the company. Tim calls up Andy himself, who he's never talked to before at this point, and asks him about this supposed ownership stake. He was like, huh? WTF are you talking about? Dave never said anything to me about you owning anything. There ain't nothing left for you to own. So I thanked him politely and immediately called Dave. When he answered, I exploded into an outburst of unintelligible gibberish punctuated by pauses to suck the drool back in my mouth. My wife came and stood next to me and urged me to think about what I was saying. So I repeated to Dave what I had just said in English, that I had just spoken to Andy and told him what he said. And he replied, what? You're not allowed to call Andy. Only I can talk to Andy. I was so taken aback by his complete disconnect from reality. I just told him that I'd be there in the morning and hung up. The next morning, Tim walks into Dave's office, sits down, and the two of them share an uncomfortably long silence. Eventually, Tim announces that he's resigning and he gives Dave an ultimatum. Option one. 
he can get paid some reasonable amount equal to his supposed share of the magazine, in which case he would be willing to stay on long enough to finish the issue for the month and train his replacement. Option two, he leaves right then and there. Tim knew that it was deadline time, and as per Dave's poor planning, they needed all hands on deck. Dave was basically forced to concede to option one if he wanted the issue to come out at all. After this, Tim did agree to freelance for the magazine for about four months, but it just sort of ended up petering out before he was officially cut loose from the company. It was at this point that the first major departure would happen, because when Tim left, he brought a few with him, and this rickety, temperamental car Dave was driving would lose a few more screws. It's not, it's not, over, not yet. over yet. I have a Patreon and a podcast. Look at it. Here comes, Here comes a dare comes devil. Dare devil. Game, 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 Game over. over. This is the game Bubsy 3D. If you're familiar with it, it's probably because it was the winner of the prestigious Gold X Award from PS Extreme Magazine. It is definitely not because of its reputation for being one of the worst games of all time. I want you to keep that in mind when I read this excerpt. <clears throat> and there you have it. Beautiful graphics, great tunes, solid gameplay, unique style, a little puzzle solving, and surprisingly deep thoughtful gameplay add up to an experience that no action slash platformer fan should miss. Now, if I told you that this is a review from a nationally syndicated gaming magazine in 1996, you might chuckle to yourself and say, <laughs> did this guy write this on acid? Actually, no. That was just his opinion. This review comes from the aforementioned PS Extreme magazine, which was founded by none other than game fan alumni Taco Brody and Tim Lindquist. Now, this isn't meant to discredit their work for the magazine. It ran for a good few years from 1995 to the 2000s. It does remain pretty obscure, however, and getting any kind of solid info on it is tricky. I couldn't even really find scans of the magazine. We do know the story of its founding, however, which occurred a few months after Game Fan's first talent exodus. Tim, Brody, and Taco left sometime in 1994, however, there were some stipulations. Taco was supposed to keep freelancing for the magazine, uh, writing a sports section for an agreed-upon amount. This also included an agreement that he wouldn't do any work for game fans' competitors. Did this work out? One of my friends came up and said, Dave, I gotta quit this job. Will you pay me? <laughs> and I tell the truth. I'm always 100% honest. I say, yeah. For a little bit. <laughs> Dave couldn't pay his full-time employees. Do you think he's going to pay a freelancer? So, fed up with inevitably not getting paid, uh, Taco decides that if Game Fan won't honor its end of the deal, it's all off. And he, Tim, and Brody form Dimension Publishing to release their own magazine, PSX. Almost immediately, Halverson sues for two things. The first is almost understandable, if ironic. It was for Taco breaking the terms of their contract. Uh, the second is... <laughs> so, PSX used the same RGB capture hardware that Tim had hooked GameFan up with, and PSX was able to get the same level of high-quality screenshots for their own magazine. Dave sued them for copyright infringement. He believed that he owned the copyright to taking screenshots with RGB capture hardware. Seriously. They ended up settling things out of court for an undisclosed sum. Now, Tim keeps things vague because they did sign an NDA, but it's safe to say that the copyright part of the suit 
didn't go very far, seeing as they kept publishing with no problem. PSX would be renamed to PS Extreme after legal threats from the media conglomerate Ziff Davis. ZD already owned several gaming magazines, including the official US PlayStation magazine, so I can kind of see the case. Oddly enough, Ziff Davis would actually end up purchasing GameFan sometime later, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. See, these legal spats were just one piece of GF history. There's heaps and heaps of stories with no real definite place in the timeline. It's a real, um, can of worms. While most of the chaos of Game Fan would occur behind the scenes, the magazine's most infamous moment would hit its pages front and center. Keep on rocking! Near the back of the book was the sports section. Now imagine you pick up the September 1995 issue of Game Fan and flip to the end to find their review of College Football 96. The only problem is that it isn't a review of College Football 96. It's a review for Ace Combat. It also contains some language that I'm not allowed to say. So, I've brought in my friend Marcia from Brazil. Say hi, Marcia. Eu vou arrancar seus dentes um por um. Marcia, save it for the bedroom. Anyway, uh, the review reads, This is the almighty Ace Combat. It will likely take the dubious honor of most kick assist game that ever was for a sim. It has all the usual components, speed, control, lots of lethal jets, and a bitch load of air-to-air -air missiles. If you don't jerk you head around the first time you play this game, you had better, you had better check your pulse. As far as originality and the latter, you will be a little mislaid and the intro will only make you say, yeah, that is going to be a game on the Ultra 64. But other than the, oh, ga the game on the Ultra 64, but others than the obvious flaws in the tiny texture map Terrors of the Sky, the game really rocks. Th a soundtrack don't don't suck neither. Wow, bonus shit or what? I mean, what the hell do those guys at Namco smoke anyway? Wish I had some. I think those little Jump. bastards love to freak. No, I take that back. I know those little Jump. bastards love to freak on military sims, and that's coolie. This game, you had better check your pulse. As far as originality and the latter, you will be a little mislaid, and the intro will only make you say, yeah, that is going to be the game on the Ultra 64. But other than the obvious flaws in the tiny texture map terrors of the sky, the game really rocks. The soundtrack don't suck neither. Wow. Bonus shit, or what I mean, what the hell do those guys at Namco smoke anyway? Wish I had some. I think those little Jump. bastards love to freak. No, I take that back. I know those little Jump. bastards love to freak on military sims, and that's cool if you're a little Jump. bastard, but I am not. Us poor white trash from SoCA will just have to play it for what it is. A video game, and nothing else. A little mislaid and the intro will make you say, yeah, that is going to be the game on the Ultra 64, but other than the obvious flaws in the tiny texture map terrors of the sky, the game... Now, you might hear that and think, did this guy write this on cocaine? Uh, again, no. Naturally, this is pretty shocking to read, uh, even now, and there was a notable outcry from their readership. Someone named John, whose full name I can't quite find, recalls the editorial reaction. I'll never forget when we got the call from Dave, or it may have been Julie that day, I forget, demanding that we take all of the current issues of GameFan off the rack. They asked us to remove the poly bags, rip out the offending pages, and then put the mags back on the racks. We complied, but not before I nabbed five unopened copies for myself, a few of which I still have today. So, what happened here? Well, an apology went out the very next month from Halverson. 
As you may or may not be aware, tragedy struck the September issue of GameFan in the shape of a sports article. This seemingly unsuspecting review was invaded with some of the ugliest text I have ever read. Though most of the issues were stopped and the page cut out, there are undoubtedly some in circulation. Imagine the reaction of the people here that have worked diligently putting in 250 plus hour months to produce the finest quality publication in the industry. People like Nick DeBarez, who not only speaks and reads Japanese fluently, but works through the night doing complex Photoshop layouts on Japanese games. It's all he'll play. E-Storm, whose dream in life is for the US game scene to mimic Japan's. Andrew Cockburn, who visits Japan frequently for GF and has a Japanese wife. It was devastating. This offensive text was actually littered throughout GameFan and was caught prior to shipping Final Film. We thoroughly believed we caught it all. However, the page in question slipped by undiscovered. We were on the tail end of a 72-hour marathon shift to get you the very latest, as usual, and went into simultaneous massive shock when we found this absurd, planted text. Apparently, we were victims of the worst joke in video game publishing history. Dave Granite, assistant editor, would later post to a Usenet forum about the incident. We had nothing to do with that outrageous text. Some party took it upon himself to sabotage game fan and wreck everything we've worked for for years. Let there be no mistake about it. Game Fan Magazine was the victim of sabotage. Spoilers. It wasn't. Now, I kind of lost my mind trying to rediscover this, but I know that months ago I found the first-hand explanation for this story. I can't get my hands on it, so take what I'm saying with a grain of salt. So what is known is that one David White was responsible for it. He was the executive producer at the time, and as we can tell from the rest of the sports section, was one of the main writers in charge of launching it. Oh, uh, I should have mentioned, this issue was supposed to be the one to overhaul the sports section to put it on par with the rest of the magazine. Oops. Anyway, the account I read from him, that I can't find, claimed that because there was such a focus on visuals in the magazine, the layouts would be completed before the actual text was put in, and therefore, they often used filler text to test them. White's editor was Japanese, and they had this game where White would put in the most offensive thing he could come up with for his editor to read, and then they would joke about it later. This little inside gag would be just fine. Until one issue. When the filler text wasn't caught in time, uh, mind you, almost every issue was cranked out under the conditions of back-to-back -back all nighters. This kind of explains the repetition and the way that sentences are just stitched together. It was probably a few lines that he just copy-pasted willy-nilly to try and fit the layout as they were making it. The fact that they tried to pin this on industry sabotage is kind of hilarious, and I almost wonder whether or not they even told Halverson the full story. This incident would lead to an encounter at the Consumer Electronics Show. Mike Wakamatsu, known as Waka, recounts him hanging out at the GF booth with their model during the show. And suddenly, some drunk guy storms up to them with the September 1995 issue in his hand, open to the college football review. He was pointing furiously at the page and cussing me out. This is politically incorrect. This is bullshit. Who wrote this piece of shit? I just looked at him and said, why the fuck are you yelling at me? You got a fucking problem to go talk to whoever wrote it. I'm not here to listen to your shit. He stood there for a moment, then walked away, sobbing. Then Kristen, the booth babe, looked at me and said, um, is that normal? We both laughed for about 10 minutes. We couldn't even hand out the mags after that. GameFan would make several appearances at CES. Uh, a few years before that, in 1993, Wolfinger tells the story of their first trip. The show was held in Las Vegas, and he got there a few days after some of the other guys had gone up to check things out. So Jay and I are going to share a room. Oh joy. And this is the room previously shared by Cockburn and Kelly. 
So we get there, and the room is thrashed. The beds are all unmade, condom wrappers everywhere. Oh boy, times two. So the next day, we are told that after asking Halverson for money, for food, etc., that Kelly, Cockburn, and Kay Kaboki promptly went and used that money to buy a hooker, which they then all shared. Then they all played Yoshi's Island. <laughs> Kelly would chime in later to add, A-OK, -okay, that shit actually did happen. What can I say? I'm a lot older and a little wiser now. P.S. The hooker's name was Simone. On this particular trip, Wolfinger would end up hitting the casinos. Uh, he ended up turning $20 into 90 and figured he might as well stop while he was ahead. Good move. They had driven there initially, and because he wasn't an editor or a PR guy, he figured there wasn't that much point in him being there, so he decided to use his winnings and book a flight to get back home a few days early. So I get my bags together and I go, Oh shit, I can't carry this on the plane! So when Jay Perrier got back to the room, I go, Uh, Jay, do you think I can give you something to take back for me? And hand him a small blue bag. He was like, Uh, what is it, T? I say, well, don't tell anyone, but, um, it's a gun. Jay, a gun? Are you nuts? What the hell did you bring a gun for? I don't know, long car trips through the desert? I always packed heat back then. LOL, more likely I had seen too many movies. So, of course, Jay told everyone back at the office about it, and for the next several months, I heard lots of entertaining comments. Hey, T, you packing? Sup, gangster? Hey, don't shoot. <laughs> There's a few people mentioned in this story that we haven't touched on yet, so let's hear a little bit about, uh... Kei Kaboki first. Kei was known as Special Kei, and was a Japanese guy who was part of the Day One staff. He was fluent in both Japanese and English, and they relied on him to translate both Japanese magazines and games. So, um... Dave had a dog. He had two dogs, actually named Snowball and Puggle, uh, both males, and they spent a lot of time in the office. In fact, uh, Terry complains about the mess that Puggle would make by his desk all the time. Now, I mentioned that they were both male, but maybe Puggle was stupid and thought Snowball was female, or maybe it was a gay dog, but he would try to mate with Snowball right out in the open. K, for his part, would take it upon himself to take care of things, to relieve the tension, to do it manually. He jerked the dog off! Regularly! In front of everyone! This is not a rumor. Everyone saw him do this. So much so that it was common knowledge around the office during and after his tenure at GameFan. Tim continues, Kay also confided to whoever happened to be listening that he was not jealous of American men. He explained that American men may have large penises, but they were not able to have very stiff erections because of that. He went on to say that Japanese men had small penises, but enjoyed the luxury of very hard erections, illustrated with a shaken fist in the air, arm bent at the elbow. I wasn't sure at the time, but now that I've met more Japanese natives, I'm relieved to find that these aren't just normal Japanese social behaviors, and K was a little off base. I don't think he was gay. Still, K was a pretty nice guy, and we were friends. We actually printed one or two of his Japanese sections in PSX. A contributor called Evil Lights checks in to add some more about Special K. He also once claimed to have been raped by a fat girl on the summit of a hill in the Japanese countryside. He told us he was so ashamed of the contact and disgusted by her fatness that after the act, he got a hold of a pocket knife and scraped off the outer layer of his penis skin. The next 
person is Kelly, uh, known in the magazine as K. Lee. Uh, Waka has quite an anecdote about him. Now this guy was an Oreo cookie, black on the outside, but whiter than most white people I know inside. Is Oreo like offensive? Meh. He apparently got addicted to meth sometime during the first time I quit, or what people call a walkabout. One of the first things he asked me when I came back was, Hey dude, good to see you back. Uh, can I ask you something later? WTF? Anyways, later I'm alone and he asks me, Hey, um, can you get some crystal meth? You know, for a friend of mine. Who the fuck is he kidding? I told him I can, but I'm not gonna bring it to work. That was the last time he ever brought it up with me. Yeah, like those pawn shop receipts on your desk for over $400 in jewelry was because you had no money for food, right? Well, I recall him getting fired at GF for something, the reason eludes me. Time goes on, and a few years later, we all hear he's doing awesome at EGM. They paid for his moving expenses, got him a company credit card, and was actually making a decent amount of money. He had a baby to raise as well. It's quiet for a while, and then we hear this shit. Apparently, his addiction followed him all the way up north. He ran up the company credit card on crazy shit. Probably pawned it on stuff for, you know what. Lost his house and his wife ran off with his crack dealer. With the baby! Talk about messed up. Now, it's worth noting from what I can tell that Kelly has since cleaned up, so... All the power to him. This leads directly into another character at the company. Uh, Nick DeBarez, known as Nick Rocks. Waka continues, Nick was notoriously known for speaking like a black person, full Ebonics. He told me it was because his school was 98% black people, and it rubbed off on him. I knew where he was going to school as well, and I could totally agree. So sometimes, during the delirium from crunch time, we would do stupid shit to give us that extra steam we needed to go on. This was one of those things. This was actually the birth of the famous Two Scoops line. Street Fighter double fireball reference in Ebonics. Yes, it's a Raisin Bran pun. Now, Kelly heard around the office that Nick did an impressive black person imitation, and he wanted so bad to hear it. But of course, Nick wasn't about to bust out with it in front of Kelly. Um, yes, he's black. That would be a bit awkward, no? Every time Nick would go into this mode, Kelly would always miss it. Unless we triggered it, of course. Hee <laughs> hee. Now this is interesting, because what we have here is a white guy who acts black, and a black guy who acts white. If they fused, you could make some kind of perfect mixed-race superhuman. One day, I was talking to Nick, and I see Kelly in the corner of my eye. We were standing there, I think Casey and Ryan were there as well, and I busted out with, What's up with that? Then Nick just went AWOL. He was going off on Ebonics and waving his hands like the gangsta he is for about 10 minutes. The whole time he was doing this, Kelly was standing behind him, listening. I couldn't take it anymore and started laughing. Nick turned around and turned white as a ghost, then turned red from embarrassment. He stood there shocked for about a few seconds and said, Uh, hey Kelly, and ran off into his office and slammed the door behind him. Needless to say, Kelly was very impressed with his impression. After all, he was much blacker than Kelly ever will be. Raffle. Speaking of Nick, there's an interesting wrinkle with him years later in the thread. He stops by to share some of his own thoughts. Uh, it turns out that he's the son of Michael DeBarres, a prolific character actor for television. Uh, he also describes his mom as a super groupie. He also got a job at the magazine when he was 15. Being so young, he seems to have built more respect for Halverson, and he comes to his defense here. What's with all the vitriol? My god, did he have the mullet to end all mullets? You're damn right, but guess what? So does Solid Snake. Were his people skills not quite adequate? Is he a flawed human being? Sure, so am I. So are you. I guess you could say I was one of his favorites, so I may not have seen the worst of him, but I'll tell you this about Dave Halverson. He loves video games. He loves video game journalism. He may have got in way over his head, but he is a genuine person. He and his wife Julie gave me my start in life, and I am hugely grateful to them for it. I'll hear no ill talk regarding Dave. He created GameFan, wrought it from the very aether. And without him, this thread would not exist. Everyone who talks shit about personal experience with him, let's face it, 
you wouldn't be where you are today without DH. Tim would respond to this with distaste. I disagree with this strongly. You can't possibly know how GameFan was truly created since you were not there. Halverson did not create GameFan out of the ether, not by a long shot. I got myself where I am today by doing what I love doing, just as Halverson got himself where he is by doing the same. Another member called Casey chimes in to join Nick's side, and in fact called Jay Pergier evil. Uh, Wolfinger would respond, Casey, it saddens me to hear you say such things. I just can't begin to fathom why anyone would want to defend Halverson. He was not a good guy. Yes, he had a pure passion for gaming, etc., but he was such a slimeball in every other facet of life. I guess I can understand the perspective of you and Nick and Shidoshi, all young kids getting their start in the industry and being grateful for their first real job. Forgiving is fine, but let's not paint the guy as a saint. Did you know all the times we were not getting paid and Dave would tell us how he's in the exact same boat, that he was in fact cashing his checks before anyone else and depleting the funds? I can go on and on. And to diss on Jay? Jay stuck it through to the end and was the only one who was actually up front with how fucked the whole situation was and honestly tried to keep it all together. Bergstein? Yes, very evil. Though only slightly more evil than Halvetica Abnormal. It's a good one. Oh yeah, let's talk about Dave Bergstein. So last episode I mentioned his shady qualities as a businessman, but I never really got into the dealings besides his payment funnies. Most of the juicy details here come from Shidoshi. Shidoshi writes, Bergstein, the guy in charge of Metropolis, had this small army of guys who did his bidding. Problem solvers, basically. No matter how big or small the problem. They were all of the same certain ethnicity, uh, Middle Eastern or something like that. The lead guy, Musha, Misha, Musha, some name like that, had supposedly made sure more than a handful of guys were never seen or heard from again back in his home country. Most of the foreign writers started working at GameFan totally illegally. They would come over on a visitor's visa, work at the office, and once their three-month vacation visa was up, they would fly back to their country and stay there a bit until they would come back on another visitor's visa. Waka fills in some extra details for us. Don't even ask me about, deleted his name for my safety lol, Bergstein's personal assistant. This guy could get a mob to whack a guy if he wanted. Drugs? He only supplied some of the staff with their needs when they wanted it. Shady, indeed. So, if you read between the lines on this one, Dave Halverson is allegedly, potentially, an accomplice to multiple international assassinations. There's a guy drugging people, there's a guy fucking a dog, there's Middle Eastern hitmen writing game reviews! I would say that there's no more, but let's face it, we both know that there is. Because at GameFan, the ride never ends. We live hard, we die hard. Listen to my podcast if you want to hear me ramble, check out my Patreon to give me money. It's not over yet. Here comes, Here comes a daredevil! Get over! I'm going to warn you that from this point on, things might get a little more scattered than the first two episodes. Throughout this series, I've been doing some timeline jumping here and there for the sake of storytelling. There's a lot going on across the company, and as we roll into the late 90s, things would start branching out even further, because 1998 would mark the year that Dave Halverson left GameFan. Now, he would stay on as a writer, but that was only to hold him over for a few months while his next project got off the ground. Gamers Republic. Get ready, Get ready, to, ready rock. to rock.
Before that, though, we need to talk about Game Fan Online. As the internet became more accessible in the 1990s, it opened up a whole new world for hobbyists of all kinds to connect and share. Naturally, the gaming crowd were ingrained into the early internet culture, and before you knew it, there were dozens of fan sites which would soon be rubbing shoulders with professional ventures into digital games journalism. I'm not sure exactly when GameFan Online was birthed, but I think it was around 1995 or 96, and at that time it was a pretty meager operation. It was basically being run by one or two people, and really just led by Ryan Lockhart, known as Orion. This is where the very helpful Shidoshi comes in. She had been trying to get picked up by various anime magazines when she found herself getting an offer from GameFan. Despite being very passionate, management wasn't happy with how harsh she could be in her reviews, and so they basically moved her towards being a copywriter. Press releases would come in, and she would go through the grueling task of rewriting them word for word for the magazine. A year or two before Shidoshi came on, the magazine had experimented with an anime-focused column called Anime Fan, edited by the contributor Takuhi. This was a pretty inconsistent section, usually only a page or two, reviewing maybe three or four VHS releases, if it even appeared in that month's issue. A decision was made to add an anime section to the website, and because Shidoshi was already interested in it and needed a place to actually use her writing skills, she was thrown on to manage the new Anime Fan Online, while she was still retyping press releases. This was probably cool and exciting at first. I mean, she wanted to work at an anime magazine anyway. Then she realized that she had no industry contacts and no experience running a website. She was good at getting info from other places, but had no way of getting scoops herself. Understandably, she didn't want the whole site to just be regurgitated content from other places, so she tried her best to round it out with reviews and other sections. At the same time, Ryan was feeling the same pressures that she was, but magnified trying to run the main site. It didn't help that he was constantly understaffed and had to keep asking for help from the magazine's writers. Eventually, he just stepped down due to the stress, which only really left Shidoshi to run things. So, she becomes the main manager of GameFan's whole online operation. Here's a word to the wise. When you have a real, quote-unquote, major site, don't put somebody with only a minimal amount of experience running a website into that position. The thing that worked into my favor was that, back then, there weren't a lot of people who had experience running websites, so people with little experience could run one and still possibly get away with it. She fully admitted that the site sucked for a while, because she had way too much responsibility, no experience, no industry contacts, no idea how to meet industry contacts, and no idea where to get news. Eventually, she threw her hands up and just started running it like a personal fan site. In a funny way, this gave GFO a distinct identity compared to the other notable gaming news sites. It really was just Molly writing about what she wanted, how she wanted. Just like how the magazine always had this ragtag garage band feel to it. She would soon be joined by Bryn Williams, and they found that they got along pretty well, so they just kept doing more of what Shidoshi was already doing. Jun, also known as J-Bomb, also came on to translate the obscure Japanese stuff that no one else was doing. Again, kind of like the main magazine. Things were going pretty swimmingly for GFO for a while, until the whole company had a major shakeup. The reasons for Dave Halverson's departure from GameFan are not super clear. I'm sure if you asked 10 different people, including Dave, you'd get 10 different answers. It's 
Not hard to theorize, though. I mean, it's a miracle that the magazine lasted this long in the first place. And many contributors will admit that they worked without pay for sometimes months on end because they just believed in the spirit of the thing. So remember how I mentioned that shady publishers look to just stuff the shelves with product and get out? Yeah, I can't imagine that that's a very long-term business strategy. Especially when the guy running your magazine is as irresponsible with money as Halverson was. In that Nintendo Life article, Shidoshi says, The ongoing story was the profits from GameFan were being funneled away to fuel other, less successful projects. I know for sure that it often felt like we were sort of a stepchild in the company, as a host of other money-making ventures. Some ridiculous, like the idea of buying thousands of animation cells from random anime thinking they'd bring in good money when resold. And attempted magazine launches happened around us. Being honest, it didn't always seem to phase the higher-ups inside GameFan that the staff were constantly not having money, which may or may not be fair. Either way, I think the situation started to deteriorate more, to the point that even Dave and the others at the top were looking for exit strategies. Dave has never shown hesitation in dropping everything and starting a whole new magazine, which I see as both a credit and a fault. Ryan Lockhart has his own thoughts. I think the reason Dave left was because he was no longer having fun. This magazine he created used to be his passion, and now it was a business with a shady partner that only cared about making money. I distinctly remember walking into Dave's office near the end, and he'd been crying. I think the realization of everything hit him, and he knew the only way out was leaving this amazing thing he built. And then he was gone. And the outside meetings began. Dave called the staff to a meeting at his house to pitch the idea of leaving everything and starting a new magazine. Most of the people who were there were offered positions at this new venture, and many ended up leaving, but some stayed on. Ryan would say that leaving Game Fan, even if Dave wasn't running it, felt wrong. There was an embedded culture in the company, a history and a vibe you couldn't get anywhere else. Or maybe it was like Stockholm Syndrome. Who knows? February 1998 would mark the last issue that Dave Halverson appeared in. After this, the credits would shuffle around for a few issues, and there was a few months gap in between August 98 to January 99. After that gap period, GameFan emerged anew. The credits no longer listed them as being under Metropolis, but Shino Media, a company that seems to have been founded and run by GameFan. Names like Jay Perrier and Jody Seltzer, who had been there for a while, were credited as Shino's managers. I can't really find any info on Shino, besides the fact that they were the publisher of the book starting in 1999. The role of editor-in-chief, or editorial director, was handed to Eric Christopher Milonis, also known as ECM. The ECM era of game fans signaled a shift in the magazine. With Dave gone, it was a chance to do something new, refreshed. That old, inconsistent anime fan column was ripped off of the website and revived in full force by Shidoshi, who turned it into a regular part of the magazine. By the middle of July 1998, it had been fleshed out to not being just a few anime reviews, but also news, manga, soundtracks, live-action Japanese movies, merchandise, just general otaku interests. It was a shame to lose contributors like Terry Wolfinger, whose art would no longer grace the covers, but it seemed from the outside that things were changing with a vision. This also came with a new, much more prickly tone that didn't sit well with everyone. ECM could be very blunt and aggressive in his writing, and for some, that edge was appealing. Others found it mean-spirited. Now that Shidoshi was contributing to the magazine again, a new team would be assigned to GameFan Online. 
this leads us to the second management of GFO. There was definitely a push to make the website a bigger enterprise, and the story of that push is told to us by Kevin DeZelms. Kevin was an avid gamer from Colorado. Uh, he was friends with a guy named Jody Seltzer, who, if you recall, ended up at GameFan. Through a series of circumstances, Kevin ended up starring on a show called Twitch, where he played one half of what he describes as Siskel and Ebert for video games. Resident Evil, in my opinion, is what these 32-bit systems are really all about. I think Capcom finally has a break away from the Street Fighter series, and it's really about time. Yeah, let's see, what does this game have? Uh, blood, guts, zombies, <laughs> and snakes, more blood. shotguns. Why would anybody want to buy the game? I know, gosh, it's, uh, <laughs> it's hard to figure out the popularity of this game. He wasn't super into being on camera, despite the producers liking him, but he said that when he got the chance to sit down with the show's editor and just watch him work, he found his true calling, as he says, hit him in the face like a stack of bricks. Twitch got put in the ground when their satellite was bought out by Fox, but Kevin used it as an opportunity to learn video editing, and he and some friends put together an hour-long videotape called High Definition, dedicated to game industry news. They plan to produce these on a monthly basis and have it get picked up by distributors and video shops. Unfortunately for them, their hopes would be dashed when some Game Informer editors had the same idea as them. And naturally, their tape got picked up first and flopped miserably. After that happened, any hopes of high definition getting picked up were basically kaput. The concept was just dead in the water. As luck would have it, they ran into a producer who was interested in putting them up, but he needed them to make a full 13 episodes of evergreen content, meaning stuff that could be played at any time, meaning no news. They were ultimately unable to pull together enough money to get it done, and Kevin thought it was all over. That is, until he reached out to his old friend Jody, asking for a job. Half joking. To his surprise, Jody got him an offer, and he ended up moving from Dead End Colorado to Sunny SoCal to join GameFan's revamped web team. Kevin would use his newfound skill and passion for video editing to cut promos for new games they had lying around the office. These short videos were so successful that publishers and PR people started giving them special early access to games because Kevin was able to make anything look good. I remember IDOS actually requesting that I take an alpha of one of their games, which had almost no enemies in it, and do a video making it look like a winner. I forget what it was, some third-person action game, but after I did it, we got the video exclusive on quite a few games after that, from them. Kevin came on with a guy named Sam Kennedy, who had a very consistent contact in Japan. This meant that they were basically getting news coming in all day. Now, you have to understand something about the internet back then, specifically gaming news sites. No one really knew everything you could do with the internet, or was even really comfortable wielding it. So every publication at that time ran their websites like they would a newspaper or a magazine. This meant that every site would update once per day, with all the stories coming out at around 6 p.m. West Coast time. There was just no other precedent for news at the time. GFO decided that because they just had info coming in all the time, they just update the website whenever they got it. It seems obvious now, because that's how all online news works, but back then this was a crazy revelation that put a lot more eyes on them. You would check GameFan online multiple times a day to see if there were any updates, which only increased their site traffic. The team at this time was made up of Kevin, Kennedy, and Brandon Justice, but they would get help from Thomas Puha, aka Riot, who served them a bunch of European contacts. It got to the point that European publications were actually salty at GameFan because they were the ones getting all the scoops for their region. 
Shortly after that, Kennedy and Justice would leave for Ziff Davis and IGN respectively, and Kevin was the sole representative for the site. At that year's E3, he pulled major weight, organizing the magazine writers, delegating shifts, and updating the website live from the booth. The site started pulling huge numbers after this, and they brought on a bunch of new staff to shore up their numbers. New staff included Anthony Chow, aka Dongo Head, Jason Weitzner, aka Fury, Levi Buchanan, aka Angus, who was poached from Nintendo Power, Rick Mears, aka The Wanderer, and Matt Van Stone. The site got a redesign to have sections for each big console headed up by team members who loved them. The site was really hitting its stride at this point. You have to understand that when I started at GameFan, the website was only getting around six to 7,000 unique visitors a day. Around the time Shidoshi and then Brandon were running it, more or less alone. When Sam and Brandon left, we were getting around 20 to 25,000 uniques. With the crew I described above, we got up to about 40,000 unique visitors per day. And that's when we decided to branch out into the PC games world. More than just consoles, they brought on Robert Howarth, known as Apache, to add a PC section to the site. This now made them a competitor to places like Voodoo Extreme and Blues News, and pumped their numbers up to 55,000 unique visitors per day. This is right around the turn of the century, like these numbers are crazy, and it looked like they were only going to get bigger. They had a great team, good content, exclusive news, and their own look and feel compared to the magazine and other sites of the day, so why have you never heard of them? What could have possibly gone wrong? So, before Game Fan was cut loose from Metropolis, it looks like Dave Bergstein made one last move to cash out before jumping ship. The details are really hard to gather, and I'm not sure exactly what happened, but Kevin refers to it as that deal. That deal, which, in his words, conned IDOS, our closest ally in the advertising sense, out of around $55 million, and used that as an incentive for DVD Express to buy us. Who was DVD Express, or Express.com as they were known? Well, kids, we're gonna talk about a little thing called the dot-com bubble. So in the late 90s, people realized that you could make money from the internet. You could make a lot of money, actually. Companies like AOL and Yahoo were looking like the future, and this created what you'd call a speculator's market. Basically, a bunch of different investors see dollar signs in something, and they start buying and pumping money into different projects in the hopes that the one they invest in becomes the next big thing. The problem is that, usually, there wasn't actually that much money to be made to begin with. Turns out there could only be a couple big financial successes in the web space, like... every couple years, maybe? And it also turns out that there wasn't actually that much money to be made in online advertising. So when you put a lot of money into something that makes no money back, a lot of people go bankrupt. There was a banker taking a company public, a pretty prominent banker, and he sent me the prospectus for the company, and the company had no revenues. There was no money coming in, like they had no customers and they were taking it public. And he said, what do you think? And I said, I'm looking out my window and there is a grandmother on the street with a, with a purse. And I bet if I go mugged her, we could go do it together right now because that's what you're doing. You're mugging the public. Express.com was trying to be the entertainment super site and they were gobbling up other websites to try and up their value so they could hopefully open to a huge IPO and make a ton of money. Bergstein pulled some shenanigans to get Express to buy GameFan online, and this led to the eventual downfall of the site. In Kevin's words, Express.com was led by, quote, the most annoying woman on the planet, Allison, who hailed from Variety magazine, and who insisted on using that vernacular in her emails, much to my great irritation. Anyway, unfortunately for Express, 
They were doing this right on top of the online advertising bubble, and it burst shortly after we moved into their offices in Hollywood. They sold me on the idea of doing a video production department that I would head up, providing video content not only for video games, but also behind-the-scenes packages for films and music on their other entertainment sites. So I turned the reins of GameFan.com over to Levi in anticipation of this video thing, which never materialized. Allison revealed not only this, but that, in fact, I should stop focusing on doing videos and do more writing, preferably news stories which drew those crucial hits. I explained that I'd given up running the site in anticipation of this new role, and now I'm left in a situation where I'm a copywriter. She looks at me straight-faced and goes, Well, that sounds like a career issue to me. Levi told me after the meeting, he saw the look on my face and my death stare at her and thought for sure he was going to see blood. Express started the Game Fan Network, which was an advertising network that tried to get ahead by snatching up a bunch of fan sites. Then that online advertising bubble burst. They couldn't actually pay the fan sites for ads and everything collapsed. This giant behemoth of Express.com just crushed itself while madly scrambling toward an IPO that kept slipping further and further away, while the pressures on us to deliver unreasonable results mounted. Plus, we were now being supervised by an ex-variety writer who knew a sum total of jack and shit about running a gaming website. Our staff was slowly decimated and workloads increased. Eventually, only Levi and Rick were left for the final few weeks, writing product descriptions for Express.com and keeping the shell of GameFan.com alive. But it was over. Now, apparently, when Express.com failed out, Dave Pergstein took the opportunity to buy them? <laughs> he then turned it into a site called DVD.com? which also went bankrupt. Cool move, Dave. Really cool move. Game Fan Online would fall sometime around 1999 or 2000, and it wouldn't be much longer before the magazine would join it. It's not, it's over, not yet. over yet. Hell, Hell fire. fire! Here comes, Here comes a comes daredevil! daredevil. Game over! Yeah, this is the intro. In June of 1998, the first issue of Gamer's Republic hit store shelves. This was it, the new visionary gaming magazine straight from the mind of Dave Halverson. Hellfire. GR shifted away from the very 90s aesthetics of Game Fan with the bold text and in-your-face screenshots to a much more Y2K look. 
According to a contributor to the magazine who goes by the username TypeFiend, Dave actually had very little to do with this visual direction. The GF art director, Gary Harrod, and Dave gave me the reins to a large extent to form the basis of the GR magazine, the masthead, title, font, style guides, etc. Typefiend cites inspirations like British design studios The Designer's Republic and Attic. Their style is reflected pretty clearly in GR's pages, busy layouts that hit you with lots of information while keeping some element of minimalism with blank backgrounds and distinct, undetailed shapes. It's meant to be absorbed and parsed through slowly to appreciate both the content and the aesthetic. Just make it look stimulating seemed to be the code. Dave founded Millennium Press to publish Gamers Republic, but he wouldn't stop at just the magazine. He wanted to expand to other print ventures, namely strategy guides. Everything was looking up for a while until to no one's surprise, internal friction. The GR contributor Akumachan chimes in in response to the game fan stories. Wow, I didn't go through even a quarter of the shit you guys went through, but I'd like to think that I kinda understand your pain. These stories are unbelievable, yet totally believable where Dave is concerned. And those pics from the early 90s of Dave? Hilarious. And for anyone who hopes he has changed, it speaks highly of you as humans to give Dave that much benefit of the doubt, but it's greatly misplaced. The stories of the end of GF so much mirror the end of GR that it makes me shudder. Akuma-chan would confirm that a few more bad behaviors carried through to the new magazine. In response to stories of Dave's style of management and delegation, that's exactly the way Gamers Republic ran. Frankly, I'm astounded anyone will print his magazine. I'm not sure I ever saw an issue of GR on time. Ever. And to Tim Lindquist's story of Dave calling in sick, LOL, awesome, he still uses that particular trick. And he still has Julie do his dirty work, but now it's her job to give people his excuses. So remember that crazy business with the game fan website? Yeah, it, ha it happened again. <laughs> there was this site called SegaNet, which was headed up by a guy named Fernando Mosquera. And in the late 90s, it was the premier news source for Sega. They also had an extension called media.seganet.com, and I'm not sure what they did exactly, but it seems like they hosted a lot of MP3s, which also pulled in big numbers. They were so successful, in fact, that Sega of America's official website actually told people to go to SegaNet for news on the then-upcoming Dreamcast. Multiple networks, including IGN, were looking to acquire them, but the team wanted to stay independent, so they just became an uh, affiliate of IGN. So everything's going great. And then one day, Fernando tells them that they're joining up with Gamers Republic. Everyone just kind of went with it and started getting ready for the move. The contributor Mina describes this process. Their server was owned by Gaming Age, so she started to download everything from the server onto her hard drive. Then her hard drive crashed, and she lost everything. Which should have been fine, because she can just download it again. Then Gaming Age wiped their account. So, everything's gone. Mina took a bit of a rage break from the internet for a week, and during this time, the rest of the team got to rebuilding the site from scratch in about three days. All new content, all new design, and an all new name. Chupa Media. Chupa means suck in Spanish, and they chose it for all the media leechers out there. Now, it looks like they've recovered until out of nowhere, they lose access to their FTP account. FTP is File Transfer Protocol, and it's basically the account they use to add content to the site. At this time, they didn't have any kind of office. Everything was remote, so they try to contact Fernando for a few days, only to be met with radio silence. When that didn't work, they contacted Gamers Republic. They were contacted directly by someone named Dave Halverson, and 
Dave told them that Fernando had ditched everyone at GR, including us. And he was saying all kinds of crap about Fernando, trying to convince us that Fernando was the bad guy and that GR was not. D and Junon were a bit pissed to learn that Fernando had dissed us, but also pissed that GR locked the FTP as a result. When this took place, Junon, Laud, and Bathory registered a new domain name, Perfect Zero, and found hosting elsewhere. They just needed the content back from GR. They asked Dave, politely, if they could have the media part of the site back, which they thought was reasonable, because it was always separate from the SegaNet news section, and I mean, without them, it was useless anyway. Dave's response was to work for him on GR, running SegaNet first. This is when the hostage situation took place. At this point, the contributor Junon is going along with Dave's demands trying to wriggle the site out of his grip. At the same time, another member named D was designing a new site, PerfectZero.com, to get it ready for the big switch when they got everything back. After a week-long game of chicken trying to get the website back, Dave hands them a proposition. Design a new SegaNet site and run it with content he gave them. They didn't actually make a new site, they just took what the ex SegaNet designer had done, remade it in HTML, and added a little script to show the latest news. It takes them like two days and Dave thinks they're wizards. In return, he offered them all free lifetime subscriptions to Gamers Republic, a magazine with a shorter lifespan than a guinea pig. Oop, spoilers. After this was done, they ask for the site back, and he comes up with another request. Add a bunch of content to bring it up to speed. They accomplish this, and he comes up with yet another demand. Move to the GR offices in LA, and they'd have the site back. The crew all call him out on this completely BS ask, and when he stands by it, told him to, quote, uh, go fuck the whore he came out of and die. But it's not over yet. You see, when they first moved to Gamers Republic, they were not given Telnet access, which meant basically that they didn't have the keys to read or write to the server. That same day, however, Junon wrote a .CGI script that gave anyone with it read-write access and planted it on the GR server. Essentially, he made a key for them. If you had this script, you could access the GR server and do whatever you wanted up to, in Mina's words, destroying the site. The only limitation was who had it. And well, a short time after leaving GR, the website had maintenance for an entire week. In Mina's words, it looked like the script got into the wrong hands. And it all ended up working out too, because the new Perfect Zero went up and running on 9999, the exact same date as the Dreamcast's launch. Everything is cool, and then a week later they get an email from Fernando. And it's from a new address. A gamefan.com address. Yeah, uh, I didn't mention it last time, but when GFO added the PC section to their website, Fernando was one of the guys heading it up with Apache. Uh, I didn't mention it because it's a spoiler. For this twist, it turns out Fernando had in fact left Gamers Republic to join GameFan Online right after being acquired by GR, but he didn't outright ditch them like Dave had claimed. He had been moving house to be closer to GameFan at the exact same time this happened and hadn't had an internet connection to communicate with them. Uh, in his defense, he did offer them all jobs at GameFan, but they declined, uh, pretty burned by what they'd just gone through. Their decision to stay independent was probably a good move, seeing how GFO would be systematically dismantled in only a matter of months. Perhaps Dave was willing to pull this stunt because of his renewed confidence in his company. A confidence which would not last more than two or so years. 
Millennium's shot at the strategy guide market was short-lived at best. If you think about it, it's pretty stiff competition. With a regular gaming magazine, you have all kinds of ways to set yourself apart. Your visuals, your staff, the types of games you cover, exclusive interviews, a variety of content, all things which have made Game Fan a cult hit. Strategy guides are more of a utility than anything. Sure, the aesthetic makes it look presentable and professional, but really, you're just there for the information. And what, are you gonna have cooler information? It's a far cry from the inside club feel of Game Fan. The only way to differentiate yourself is in the games you're able to scoop up, but why do publishers have any reason to go with your little startup when they could just go to Prima or Double Jump, the established names with connections and proven track records? The only noteworthy game they ever ended up getting was Metal Gear Solid, and sure, it's an all-time classic and a massive hit in its day, but it's just not enough. The company wasn't doing well financially. It seems like history was just repeating itself with stories of employees going unpaid, and apparently he even kept the three-foot Sonic statue. The legend. Still, it wasn't all bad. One interesting thing with a lot of these stories is that the people who had to deal with Dave's antics clearly don't approve, but many look back on their time with him as a fun, if stressful, kind of adventure. One of my favorite Halverson moments was when we went into the supply closet where he stored some of his personal collection of games, toys, memorabilia, where we found a CD from 80s new wave hair travesty, Kajagoogoo. When confronted with his choice in music, he went into full denial mode, almost seeming angry that anyone would claim it was his. Of course, he later admitted to owning it. In retrospect, Dave could be either seemingly the nicest man or a complete liar depending on mood or situation. I believe it's in his nature to be both. He was personally pretty nice with me until the very end of my days at Gamers Republic where he freaked out when everyone started to leave en masse because we weren't getting paid, like in the GF days, all over again. I basically lost all respect for him when I witnessed his sexist and bigot side when we hired an Asian woman to help production design. The contributor Dolomite presses for details. How exactly did he freak out? I mean, what did he expect his staff to do if they weren't getting paid? How many walked out at once? Details, buddy. And what did he do to her? Did he call her a little... <sighs> Marcia! She's busy, goddamn. You can read that. Freak out, meaning literally freaking out, running around shouting profane accusations about anyone and everyone, all the while waving his arms and once even charging at me while I was on the phone with one of my former co-workers who had already left slash quit. I think five to six people initially left as they got good offers from a larger publishing company. I left soon afterward to art direct the official Sega Dreamcast magazine. That was a whole drama in itself. People were jumping ship like crazy, and those who stayed were very disgruntled. Daily closed-door meetings where most of the time we were discussing how much we hated Dave's lies about how things were going so well. Really, he could have earned our trust and respect much more if he simply shared the bad news in an honest manner. But he always took the route of masking the truth, thus the ill will back then. In terms of the racist, sexist attitude, all I will say is that he basically made working at GR hell for this young lady, and on her last day, unbeknownst to her, laid into her so badly she came out shaking, crying, and later furious. She was actually thinking of litigation at one point. On a lighter note, I remember when someone installed a Mac extension during the OS 9 days onto his machine which would allow us to make pop-up system dialog boxes come up onto his desktop at our whim. We spent quite a while sending him pop-ups warning about incorrect binary trap error, negative 06, or some other bullshit error, and then slowly changing them into more personal and strange quote-unquote warnings about gay anime porn files exceed storage capacity. Reboot. I'll give Dave that credit. He allowed us kids to be kids. Over at GameFan, things weren't much better. 
There aren't a lot of details about the final days of the magazine, but we have some idea of what happened. The Wikipedia page describes a series of lawsuits from all the investors that Dave scammed out of thousands, but this is unsubstantiated and I couldn't find anything to really back it up. December 2000 would mark the 88th and final issue of Die Hard Game Fan, featuring a cover story on Final Fantasy IX. It's a little strange reading ECM's last letter. There isn't a hint of finality to it. It's pretty jovial, actually. In the Nintendo Life interview, Shidoshi is asked about the end of the magazine and offers this. It's kind of hard to answer that because it was almost as if one day Game Fan existed and the next it was gone. Not being in the office, if there were any signs on the wall, I wasn't there to see them. So I was basically just doing my everyday job of working on stuff for the next issue and handling the day-to-day -day for Anime Fan Online, and then I was told, I think by ECM, that Game Fan was dead. Of course I was freaking out about not having a job, but way more than that, it was crushing to know that Game Fan was gone. I loved the magazine, and still do to this day, and more than just a job, it was a family. A project I deeply believed in and cared about, and something I'd been a fan of long before I was an employee. Working at Game Fan had been a dream, one that I never could have imagined would come true. And now, that dream was dead. Gamers Republic would outlive Game Fan only by a few months. After several missed issues, the 36th and final cover would run in August of 2001. Uh-oh, uh-oh, you, you hear that? It's the end of an era. Time to reminisce on memories that I couldn't fit anywhere else. It's the lightning round, baby. This is the Game Fan Media Kit. What the hell is even that? Uh, so, the execs from Capcom gave Nick DeBarres a hard time because he'd positioned the artwork in his Street Fighter EX reveal to make it look like Dalsim was copying a feel. <laughs> a couple of the game fan staff were having a meeting in Jay's office which overlooked the parking lot when someone says, Hey Waka, isn't that your car being towed? And then Waka runs outside to watch his car being pulled away at that very moment. Bergstein just looked at him and said, don't worry, I'll take care of it. The magazine needed to find a better quality printer and happened to have a family connection with a printing company. However, Halverson was a real stickler for print quality, so they always sent one or two people to do so-called press checks. Uh, it was a really long drive and it happened in the middle of the night, so no one liked being on press check. Halverson would always look at every page in the magazine and find something wrong and get all pissed off and insult whoever went on press checks. It was always fairly minor stuff, stuff that happens in every magazine like misregistration, blues going purple, etc. Finally, he got so fed up with printing problems, he decided he was going to go on a press check himself. So he loaded up a shitload of games in the car to hook up to the crappy TV in the waiting room and we head down to Wolfer Printing. Of course, nobody thought to bring a fucking RF modulator to hook them to the crappy old TV, so we're bored out of our skulls by the time the press dude calls us out to look at the first SIG. Halverson picks up a sheet and rubs it between his fingers, holds it up to the light, and starts freaking out. He's going off that he's paying for 80 pound paper, and this is fucking 70 pound paper, and he's not paying for this crap. I'm standing there thinking, no fucking way he can tell the difference between goddamn 80 pound paper and 70 pound paper with his fat fucking fingers. So the press dude hauls out a micrometer and measures the paper. Sure e fucking nuff, old micro digits Halvey caught him red handed trying to stiff us on the paperweight. He was the living press check god for a while after that. 
At one point, uh, Terry Wolfinger was learning digital art and managed to convince Dave to let him do an entire cover on digital. So all went pretty smoothly, it wasn't perfect, but I was learning as I went and also using a mouse. No Wacom tablets back then. So I show Dave and Jay and they point to the giant baby and say, what's up with the flesh color on the baby? Why is it gray? It looks dead. I look and I couldn't really tell and then had to confess that I was massively colorblind. I explained that I could get by by reading the color labels on my paint bottles, etc. Jay thought that was the funniest thing. A colorblind artist. And Dave, I think he felt like he had been duped. I soon learned to always check the color picker to see what color range I was in. The contributor Rubus recalls working late one night when he thought he was the only person in the office when suddenly he hears a noise coming from somewhere. He investigates and finds Nick DeBarres with a styrofoam cup out of which he pours a thick brown goop onto his hand and then smacks it against some paper on the wall. Nick didn't realize Rubus was there, so Rubus just kind of watched him look at the print, shake his head, and then do it again. <laughs> He found out the next day that, apparently, he was getting a photo of a bloody handprint for his Resident Evil layout. He just color corrected the brown to red. At some point, Ziff Davis bought GameFan to bulk up its numbers in addition to Electronic Gaming Monthly. I didn't really mention it because nothing seems to have really come of it and I can't even really find out when it happened. There was a controversy surrounding their review of Street Fighter Alpha 2. The PlayStation port was given perfect scores, but the Saturn port was docked an unacceptable 2 to 5 points because, according to the editors, the shadows aren't blue. There were more reasons than this, like the audio quality was a little worse, but the lack of blue shadows became the too much water of its day. They got so much backlash over this review that Halverson had to issue an apology the next month explaining that they were actually wrong. The blue shadows were in the game, they had just been given a slightly early version compared to what ended up on store shelves. Here's one that a viewer sent in. So Nick DeBarres can read Japanese and would often be given Japanese copies of games to review. He gave glowing praise to the original Japanese version of Lunar 2, and when the English translation came out, he was given it again to compare the two versions. According to him, the localization had totally butchered the original script, adding in lowbrow humor and western pop culture references in what was kind of supposed to be a serious fantasy epic. Things spilled onto the interwebs when Halverson came to verbal blows with Victor Ireland, the president of Working Designs, who translated the game. There are numerous accusations of lying, fraud, and homophobia, all the good stuff in this epic exchange, and a number of people are against Dave and defend WD. So what was the translation actually like? Well. If we take a look at the cutting room floor, we have some examples. So the original line is this, which means something like this. And WD translated it as Gruel, gruel, the magical soup. The more you slurp, the more you poop. Uh, what's another one? Okay, so this roughly translates to I've given up on learning magic, but I've started doing whatever else I can to support the Magic Guild. And they translated it as... Oh, they slaughtered this game. Holy shit. It is maddening to read these responses where people are giving them the benefit of the doubt and saying, hey, Japanese humor probably doesn't translate well. They just had to change things to fit an English-speaking audience. So I, like, study Japanese, so I can actually read this. There is no joke here. There is not even an attempt at humor unless it's incredibly subtle. Dave and Nick were 100% right. Uh, Shidoshi tells a story about some guys from THQ coming around the office to promote their new game, Versus. 
Apparently the character Mia was based on, quote, a real girl that one of the lead developers had a hard-on for. They bring that real girl down to the office and they all sat down to play. The other staff went easy on her and we're just kind of joking around, but not Shidoshi. She goes hard. She destroys her and suddenly the PR lady for THQ pulls out a Sony Discman with a Versus sticker on it and then announces that Shidoshi won the tournament. They had no clue it was even a tournament, but in Shidoshi's words, the THQ PR woman was a total hottie, so even though their game sucked ass back then, I loved it when they stopped by. And finally, a story from Rick Mears, who apparently had some pretty bad writing skills, so the other staff members pranked him by sending him to an adult English class meant for immigrants? That just... That's just fucked up, come on guys. <laughs> With two magazines dead and buried, staff would move on to new ventures. ECM started a short-lived magazine called Game Go before joining Prima Guides. Kind of ironic. Most of the GR staff went to Computech. However, a select few would join Dave for his next project, Play Magazine, including some familiar faces. It's not, it's over, not yet. over yet. The Last, the last stand. stand. Here, Here comes the Daredevil. Daredevil. Game, Game over. This is the 2006 reboot of Sonic the Hedgehog, known colloquially as Sonic 06. It is infamous for being one of the highest profile gaming disasters. A game too ambitious to be rushed out the door as it was well before it was ready to meet unreasonable deadlines. In years since, it has become the butt of jokes, a symbol of the series lowest point, and even one of the worst games of all time. I want you to keep that in mind when I read this excerpt. Sonic the Hedgehog literally has everything. Platforming, some of it amid situations you simply will not believe. High-speed chases, close-quarters combat, multiple vehicles, flying, speed zones, character customization, real-time cinemas, skillfully acted, this is Sega's best localization to date, beautiful CG, telekinesis, RPG elements, open-world exploration, rail grinding, Rampant diversity, epic bosses, a fantastic soundtrack, a beautiful princess to save, you actually spend a level carrying her, and next-gen visuals that will make you happy to be alive. You simply can't ask for more out of an action game. Mission accomplished. Sonic is born anew. 9.5 now, if I told you that this was a review published in a nationally syndicated gaming magazine in 2006, would you believe me? What if I told you it was written by none other than Dave Halverson? After the latter half of Gamers Republic, Dave's third foray into print magazine would come in the form of Play Magazine. Uh, no, that's the UK Play Magazine. This is Play Magazine, the US version. Would you believe this company is a pain in the ass to Google? The Last, the last stand. stand. The first issue premiered December 2001, only a few months after GR's closure. Dave really hit the ground running, uh, maybe he had things lined up before Millennium went under? This new magazine would be under Fusion Publishing, a company I cannot find any info about other than the fact that they published Play and another book called Geek Monthly. 
Fusion is a really generic name for a publisher, and they've either been wiped from existence or absorbed into something else. I don't know if the company was founded or run by Dave, but it doesn't look like it, as he apparently had little control over the business end of the company. Rather, he claims his role was 100% creative. This was not going to be like Gamers Republic, this was more like Game Fan, like the old days. It was the closest magazine to ever get to a Game Fan revival in my mind, at least when looking at the mix of staff plus coverage. It had Dave, Nick, Casey, Mike Hobb, Substance D, and myself. Gamers Republic I kind of don't count because that was basically take half of the Game Fan staff to a new mag, so it wasn't necessarily a revival. Plus, I remember it covering more of a broader base of popular games, whereas Play got back to having a heavier Japanese and niche gaming slant. It's true that Play stood out from its competition by embracing games no one else would ever think to give top billing. Just the third issue featured Gun Valkyrie on its front cover, an Xbox-exclusive third-person shooter from Sega. Halverson's letter in issue 1 states the intent of the magazine pretty clearly after discussing all the upcoming games of the season. Play doesn't stop there because neither do you. You'll notice that we have quite a bit of, for lack of a better term, lifestyle coverage. Believe it or not, there are a few things in life as intoxicating as video games. Yes, it's true. So by leaving some of the prosaic game filler on the cuting room floor, we offer editorial that fits that mold. Japanese anime, some of the edgier fare on TV and DVD, in gear and music, and anything else that sparks our interest. Much like Game Fan, Play sought to deliver not just gaming news, but a cool underground club catering to nerdy subcultures of all kinds. In this same issue, only about half of the page count is about games. The rest is dedicated to anime, DVD releases, television, merchandise, and music. There's even an interview with Joan and Vasquez. Editorials had that familiar Halverson oddness. For instance, this one from issue 35. Hip-hop music is a beautiful thing. I love all the big butts and excess. Humvees rolling up full of girlies, and great people like Nelly and LL getting their message out there to kids that they can do whatever they aspire to. But do we really need so many games exploiting the hip-hop culture? No offense to all of the people out there who think it's cool, but if you're a white guy trying to get all fashizzle, you're just a poser. Following the editorial letter is the inked section, with all sorts of fun little bits, like the eBay oddity of the month weird news stories, gaming history, and interviews with industry insiders. Like this section on E.T. video games. Uh, when E.T. phoned home for the first time, Drew Barrymore didn't have breasts yet. Wait, who did Drew Barrymore play in E.T.? No, Who wrote that? Stylistically, play more closely resembles the end of Gamer's Republic. By its final two issues, GR had matured its Y2K aesthetic into a cleaner, more minimalist look. Play solidified this with slick, single-color backgrounds, usually white, black, or gray, flat color blocks, and Helvetica font. Uh, maybe it's Helvetica. Uh, it looks like it. Font experts tell me in the comments. It was around this time that game fan alumni started reconnecting on message boards and forums to catch up and share their stories. This reunion inspired Tim Lindquist to suggest a kind of comeback. You know, screw writing a book about what once was. We should put our effort instead into making something that is great once again, like making a new magazine in the spirit of game fan. No stranger to starting magazines himself, he got together a pretty respectable team that included game fan OGs like Greg Off and Terry Wolfinger, among others. This became Hardcore Gamer Magazine, which ran its first issue in 2005. It appears that the seeds planted by game fan were finally starting to blossom into a number of crops, while the original sower was finding success himself.
Now, Dave has always written for his magazines, but most of the important stories concern him as a businessman and a manager, uh, with him taking on a 100% creative role, uh, we finally get to talk about his writing. In 2004, Dave launched a side project called Girls of Gaming, an annual magazine dedicated to female video game characters. And I am not going to talk about it. Because I already made a video on it, like a year ago. Yeah, uh, that was my first introduction to Dave, and the inspiration for this whole series. Go check it out. It's a little, uh, it's a little rougher than my, my current stuff, but it's fun. Play is the era of Halverson's where I want to say he grew his infamy outside of the very enthusiastic part of gaming magazine readership. We were past the dot-com bubble, and forum culture was just starting to take root, meaning that you didn't even need any of his magazines to be published in your country to have heard of his... colorful opinions. I know you're itching to hear more about it, so let's talk about that Sonic 06 review. Dave was well known and often mocked for his love of platformers and critters, as well as play having an overall positive spin on many games. There had been disappointments in gaming before, instances of too much hype for a mediocre title or a company jumping the shark, especially in this era. Sonic 06 was different. In a world where patching was not yet the standard, most people at the time could not even fathom a mainline game in a series as well regarded as Sonic coming out so... It's just fucked. It's just fucked up. And in comes play with a whopping 9.5 out of 10. This review is abysmal. There are 12 paragraphs. Four of them actually discuss the game. The first two thirds, the bulk of the article, is just Dave talking about the history of the series and his personal opinions on it and individual people who worked at Sega and the E3 trailer of the game that made him cry? And then he gets to the game and it's my least favorite kind of review because it's barely a review. It's just a summary of things that are in the game with vague, it's good language tacked on. There's more critique of Sonic 3D Blast in this review than the game it's about. It should be called Sonic Universe. In its open world? There is not a single mention of the bugs. Oh, wait, down here uh, at the bottom in the pros and cons section. Uh, pros, the best Sonic ever, hands down, 2D or otherwise. Cons, still just a few little bugs but ant-sized. You will be relieved to hear that in the very next issue, a retraction was made by Halverson, correcting the score from 9.5 to a much more fitting 8.5 because of load times. Within that second review is a little detail that he didn't mention the load times in his review because he was told by Sega that they were only in the build of the game he played, and wouldn't be in the final release. This raised some questions at the time about whether or not game journalists could be trusted. I mean, what's to stop publishers from just lying about what's going to be changed in the final build? It could also have just been Dave being... Dave? Let's take a look at some other examples collected by Kevin Gifford of the now-defunct Game Set Watch. You want casual gaming? And you bought a Wii? <laughs> take it back and do yourself a favor. Meet Eye of Judgment. Shelf life forever. Now that's what I call a duck. If this one doesn't launch a major franchise, then there's absolutely, positively, no justice in the world for Valhalla. If this doesn't float your boat, then you're living in a dinghy. <laughs> a, a dingy? See that 80-foot motor yacht about to run you down? That's me. <laughs> X-Blades certainly has all the requisite ingredients. 
There's the parallax mapping, high dynamic range lighting and rendering, radiosity lighting, radiance transfer slash indirect, subsurface lighting, scattering shadow effects, depth mapping, ambient shadows, volumetric lighting, motion blur, dynamic color image correction, trail effects, animation blending, and one of the most epic asses ever. Portal is neat, I guess, if you're bored, but short. The only problem? We may never see Faith's beautiful face as it's been depicted on many a magazine cover. We also don't see much of her body. Her point of view begins below her chest, and so far, there are no in-game cutscenes. Then again, the game is called Mirror's Edge. It can't be long until she's standing in front of one. Is it too much to ask to enjoy my critter-based epics and various action-slash-adventures without having to be reminded that the average on game rankings doesn't echo my enthusiasm? Tyrus is a beautiful heroine. So beautiful, in fact, that the absence of dynamic animation is all the more puzzling. Her distinctive walk and run, separate animations for every beast, and there really isn't anything more intoxicating than a beautiful half-naked woman riding bareback on a snarling beast, and superb battle movement make the flat stance on sloped surfaces and steps a real head-scratcher. Her boobs are motionless until you reach Fiend's path, too, after which they have subtle, natural animation, but I'm guessing that's due to the detail on her various tops. Some flies, eh? Darn limited boob animation? All of these quotes are from one year. These are just from 2008. That last one was for Golden Axe Beast Rider, a game Dave was just gaga for as a return to form for the true hardcore gamer. It wasn't received too well by most other publications, and most of them found it pretty generic, but to Dave, those people were shams. The majority of these people, can't call them critics, either didn't complete a fraction of the game, don't understand game design, or just plain suck at games. To score Beast Rider below a 7 is just irresponsible. These are not valid opinions of professional gamers. It's painfully obvious these people have at best grazed the surface of the overall game which by action gaming standards is anything but short. Yeah, for all its wackiness, there really was nothing like it on the shelves, which made it all the more depressing for longtime fans when the magazine was squashed like a fly at the start of the next decade. I don't know where else to fit this in. So this is really confusing to me, and I don't know if this is totally correct, but there was also a separate unrelated relaunch of Die Hard Game Fan, the brand, but as a website that happened in 2007. It has no involvement from Dave besides having his blessing to use the name. It's really weird and I don't get it. Out of nowhere, without so much as an announcement in its pages, Play Magazine ceased publication in January 2010 when Fusion filed for Chapter 7 bankruptcy. That's the bad one! With Dave supposedly not handling finances, the reasons should point elsewhere. I mean, it's not actually too crazy to imagine things were getting rough even without him buying a three-foot Sonic statue, which he did bring to the play offices. Magazines were already going out of style, and in the wake of the 2007 and 8 recession, everyone was hurting. I mean, except the people who caused it, they were just fine, but common folk who made video game magazines were not. Were there shenanigans behind the scenes? Oh, yeah, definitely. Shidoshi left an extensive list of what was owed to the staff, and I don't think any of these people ever got what they deserved. Immediately following the closure of play, however, was the suspiciously quick announcement of Halverson's next project. A revival of Game Fan Magazine. I'm talking February to April. According to Shidoshi, Dave had somehow built an escape plan into the company. Things were set up so that if Fusion got in trouble, Dave would be able to separate himself from it and start a new company. For the people who were working for him, however, they've basically been told too bad about all the money they were owed, and they were used until they would no longer put up with not being paid. Unlike the previous two sunk ships, we actually do have a statement from Dave on why the magazine shut down. 
Responding to an inquiry from VentureBeat, he said, It was a culmination of things that ultimately took Fusion down. What was a terrible year ad-wise was made all the worse via Geek never finding its audience. A great mag, though. It was a big drain on the company, but a risk admin felt, I'm told, was worth taking considering the potential. It just got worse, though. This economy is like nothing we've ever seen. Shame they robbed Peter to pay Paul, though. Had I known, I would have done everything in my power to stop it, but my role was 100% creative. That said, I guess everything would still have been okay had Q4 panned out anywhere close to normal. But turns out it was a disaster. Over 60% of our advertisers decided to abandon print and go online exclusively. No matter how much we fought and could prove our readers choose print, they just slammed the door in our face like we were pond scum. It was a rude awakening after 18 years. There's too much turnover in the game biz. Too many relationships come and go. Our best clients have always stood by us, or moreover, our readers. So once again, I've decided to tough it out and stay the course developing print, rather than joining the online community. When play went, there was an outburst of love and appreciation for this oddball magazine. The blogger Skets describes showing an issue to two of his friends, both veterans of the publishing industry. One of them was struck by the fact that in the editorial page it showed the previous issue was having Lunar Nights on the cover. No magazine would ever have given such a niche game cover time. And that, for me, epitomizes play. They were an independent little guy, the scrappy junkyard dog of the magazine world, putting up the good fight for the little guy and championing what would otherwise be overlooked. They gave Odin Sphere cover time, with Halverson stating he did it to change things. They gave Castlevania on PSP cover time, where for the first time we received Chino Rondo in English. They gave Muramasa cover time, with a racy nod to one of Hokusai's prints, and then gave it 18 pages of editorial. I've never seen 18 pages for anything, in any other magazine. The two authors who went to Japan spent time talking about obscure kabuki plays and even included a photo of the outside of the company's building. It could be the best article I've ever read. No one else gave so much attention to Muramasa. In that same issue, they gave detailed coverage to shmups, an otherwise dying genre. How many other mags would take the time to examine the genre across all formats, especially when you'd need a Japanese 360 to do them justice? Play tried to change the world, but no one listened. That blog post touches on something that's kind of been swept under the rug in recent years, and maybe a little uncomfortable to bring up, but I think it's also important. In the late 2000s into the 2010s, there was this weird surge in anti-Japanese sentiment in gaming discussion. Not full-blown racial hate or anything like that, but a lot of intellectuals of the gaming world just kind of decided that if a game came out of Japan that it was bad, it was archaic and sloppy and unappealing to anyone but a shrinking audience. Like, there's this crazy video of Phil Fish at a GDC panel in 2012, only two years after Play shut down, where this guy who came all the way from Japan and really admires his work asks him what he thinks of Japanese games, and Fish replies... They suck. I'm, I'm sorry, like, you guys need to get with the times and uh, make better interfaces oh, wow. and, like, update your technology. Uh, we're totally kicking your ass. Back then, you guys were the king of the world, but time has passed. Everyone just laughs so and laughs. No one talks about this, but it's, like, really shitty, <laughs> the sentiment that is its own topic entirely, uh, to be honest. And in that environment, Play had the balls to not only give crazy niche Japanese games front covers, but also pour pages and pages over them, some of which have gone on to become cult classics years after the release. And for that, 
I have to commend them. The new and improved Game Fan Magazine would hit store shelves around early 2010 and continued the tradition of spotlighting lesser known titles with Blade Kitten, which you've never heard of. Yeah, that first issue was crazy because the cover art was supposed to be um, No More Heroes. I actually done yeah. this cover for No More Heroes 2 for the 100th issue of Play Magazine. It was already done. Oh. Approved. Um, and then Dave said, we're going to move that to Game Fan. That'll be our launch issue. Uh, and so we had a No More Heroes coverage in there. We had an interview with the direct, with Grasshopper and all them. Mm -hmm. um, but when the issue was done, Dave said, uh, you know, the games, it's already out. We need a new game. We can't put an old game on the cover. I'm like, well, what are we putting on the cover? He's like, Blade Kid. Blade Kid. Yeah. Right. I'm looking at it. How and I'm like, oh, yeah. look, Dave, I appreciate that you covered this. This is not good art. You'll have to forgive me because scans of the latter half of play were impossible to come by, and all I have of the new game fan is covers. Which is weird because there was a digital version available from their site. In any event, there were so few issues of new game fan that I can literally go issue by issue. Issue 1, April 2010. The magazine releases with several key staff from Play on board, including illustrator Rob Duenas. It had this gimmick where the backside of the magazine was a different book called Movie Fan, and you flipped it upside down to read it? But they had this thing on the back. Someone thought it'd be... Dave told me it was Matt's idea, but you can take Dave's opinion. With, you know what I mean? It's like Michael yeah. Scott. Like, that may be true. I yeah. don't know. Yeah. Someone decided to make Game Fan a flip book magazine. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Where I remember one side that. is Game Fan and the other, the other side, side is movie. movie Fan. And I was told yeah. that I didn't have to worry about Movie Fan. I'm oh. just making the Game Fan part. Okay? Oh, goodness. But nobody had Game Fan, Movie Fan, anything. They didn't have pages. They didn't have a logo. They didn't know what it was going to look like. And so Dave said, can you just do something really basic, like just, just like play – and I'm like, ah, oh, I, I guess I can. I'm like, where are the assets, the, all the images? He's like, we got movie posters and we got, we got these images. Everything was web size, 100 kilobytes. We're talking like 200 pixels wide. Oh, man. <laughs> and so, like, on, you can't put that, no matter how you scale it up, guys. You can't, that's like dropping. Yeah, that's not going to work. Yeah. That's like dropping a dime in a ball pit. Yeah. And being yeah. like, there's my dime. What I had mean? to make movie fan in about 24 hours. From scratch, I had to get all the assets. Mm. I, I my way around it was I had a I had a 3D program, so I typed all the uh, assets, all the names of the logos for the sections of the magazine in 3D, and rendered them out really quick and put them in there just to give it a different look from Game Fan. Mm -hmm. And I remember when that came out, ex Game Fan people and NeoGaf were just like, "In this 3D text, ha ha ha!" You know, <laughs> he learned. <laughs> so looks like their graphic designer learned how to make 3D text. Ah, ha, 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 ha. you know, it's just that first issue was just a comedy of like a giant comedy of errors. They dropped that after issue two, but they did keep the content on movies as well as anime and DVD releases like at play. That second and last issue of Movie Fan also contained one of, if not the, last interviews with Satoshi Kon before he died. The magazine would release its first five issues on a pretty consistent every other month schedule. And the last issue of the year was in December, so you'd imagine that the next one would be February. Right? Issue 6. August 2011. After an eight-month gap, supposedly caused by problems with advertising revenue, Issue 6 would release with a completely new editing team. I mean, at least things should be back on track. Issue 7, December 2011. Following a three-month gap, this one was apparently put together by only three people. Dave, Rob Duenas, and James Bacon, the managing editor at GameFan. Following this, Duenas would leave the magazine and explain why on a DeviantArt post. Too much work, really. 20 hours a day for two weeks straight and I'm still short cover art. It's just too much for me to handle. I'd rather draw and paint than lay out mags. They need a dedicated graphic design person who can handle quick stuff. I'm really an illustrator first. 
Bacon would also leave shortly after. In April of 2012, GameFan released a press statement that said that they wanted to, quote, increase their online presence. Hmm. For the first time, they would create a YouTube, a Tumblr blog, a Twitter, and a Facebook account. They didn't even have a Facebook for the business. Issue 8, July 2012. Six months after the previous, Issue 8 would be released digital only. A contributor named Wesley Roucher would leave the magazine, stating on Twitter that the job, quote, lacked the necessities to keep food in my belly and a roof over my head. Issue 9, February 2013. A seven-month drought would be ended with Issue 9, another digital-only release and supposedly put together by just two people, Dave and another staffer named Greg Orlando. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24! 24 months! Issue 10, February 2015. After a two-year hibernation, GameFan was back with a brand new design and layout, uh, speculated to be easier to put together. Three months later, on May 6th, GameFan announced a partnership with Destructoid. So now the back half of the magazine would include Destructoid written content? That's right, content you could already find for free on the internet you could now wait to pay for in print. Woohoo! Let's see, here is the other half of the book. One does not save the universe without fashionable haircuts and matching pants. Project Runway the game? Nah, the new Final Fantasy looks amazing. <laughs> That's terrible. According to the announcement, this partnership would finally let them publish on a monthly schedule. So, four months later, Issue 11, June 2015. The 11th and final issue of Game Fan would release to no fanfare. And then it was gone. Vanished. Not even an announcement. The website now links to crypto. That was it. Game Fan died. Not with a bang, but an uncharacteristic whimper. There are far, far too many people and threads that pass through Dave's madhouse to talk about every single one, but we can go over some of the highlights. Tim Lindquist would go on to have a flourishing career in publication, starting not only PS Extreme, but also Double Jump Strategy Guides and Hardcore Gamer Magazine, which actually still exists today, albeit as a meager web presence. He transitioned this into a job at Sony doing documentation, and is now the Senior Technical Project Manager at PlayStation's US branch. Terry Wolfinger has found success working in multiple realms of entertainment, including being a storyboard artist for the music video to Michael Jackson's Ghosts, and in the makeup department for Terminator 3. He currently works as a freelance artist, and you should check him out. His stuff is cool. Eric Christopher Milonis would continue to work in the print industry, writing strategy guides for Prima. He would also lend his graphic design talent to design a few gaming t-shirts, including the, the, the Gamergate t-shirt. He would unfortunately pass in 2018 for reasons that have been left private by his family. Nick Tavares has had a successful career branching off into strategy guides, localization, graphic design, and journalism. He also apparently won a contest to design the poster for the Resident Evil movie? Uh, okay. George Wising has bounced all around production and design roles since GameFan, including working at Santa Monica Studios, and has been serving as director of Sony's external developer 
xdev for almost 20 years. It's hard to track down exactly what Andrew Cockburn has been up to in the last few decades, but suffice to say he's not dropping LSD in the coffee pot anymore. He shows up to the forum under the username Jesus is God and explains why he was so crazy back in the day. His dad took his own life when he was only two, and Dave became a weird sort of father figure to him. He describes his influence as making him, quote, such an evil person who only thought about getting money for weed, sex, and more sex. After a tumultuous relationship with an ex-wife, he had, at least at the time around 2004, settled down with a new woman he describes as the perfect match. She loves Jesus, video games, animals, food, people, family, computers, web design, traveling, and me. Never marry just for one out of the three possible connections, the physical. You need at least two out of the three for it to work. Mental, physical, or spiritual. Shidoshi would take the name Molly Patterson sometime during the late 2000s or early 2010s. She's worked as a director and senior editor at EGM Media for over a decade now, and has started several podcasts focusing on gaming and Japanese entertainment. Morning, a huge podcast started in 2010, features her alongside Nick DeBarez and Casey Lowe. Lowe, for his part, went into strategy guides following his time at GameFan. He's now a translator for games and manga. Jay Perrier went straight to the games industry and is now the director of brand development at Treyarch Studios. Ryan Lockhart would also have an industry career, being on the design team for 2019's Modern Warfare. After GameFan Online, Kevin DeZelms would work as an editor in the TV and film industry for several years before leaving the business and going into realty. The Die Hard Game Fan website reboot that had nothing to do with the magazine is still around, but it's more of an archive, if anything. There hasn't been a new post since 2018, and it appears to be folded into something called Inside Pulse, which has a separate gaming section, which is active. I don't know what's going on here. Rob Duenas left Game Fan to have a continued career as a graphic designer and illustrator. You might have enjoyed his character designs for Crash Bandicoot 4. Dave Bergstein only ever saw GameFan as a small piece of his business. He has a checkered history, but let's just say that in 2016 he was arrested and found guilty of defrauding investors for over $26 million and is currently serving an eight-year prison sentence. See you in two years, Dave. Oh, and speaking of Dave, Whatever happened to THE Dave? Well, after GameFan shuttered its doors, he just kind of dropped off the face of the earth. He hasn't tweeted since 2015, the social media accounts for GF have been inactive, and he doesn't even have a LinkedIn. In the end, the magazine just couldn't pull in the advertising numbers to continue existing. It was an indie publication in a rough economy, especially for print, that served a niche audience. Dave Halverson is undoubtedly a mixed character. I've done an extensive amount of research, reading, and listening over the course of the last few months just to track his exploits, and I don't even know if I could say anything concrete about him. He certainly did some bad things. He lied, scammed people, he wasn't a great manager, and could be a bit of a pervert. Uh, but at the same time, so many people who worked with him caveat their stories with something about his dedication and how fun it was to work for him, even if they were getting screwed. Uh, the meeting went really nice. I mean, Dave has never, I don't know, like, Dave gets so much flack, dude. But when you hang out with Dave, you're like, that was fun cool guy like, like yeah, you know yeah. it, it's it's when dave needs to cut a paycheck you're like i don't like dave you know <laughs> <laughs> this, like this is what i've read like this is what i've heard yeah i find this quote from that venture beat interview fascinating he says that the way game fan was taken from us has always haunted me that doesn't sound like someone who was just in it to make money when I read his writing and his public addresses, 
I don't hear PR speak. Maybe he's just really good at seeming honest, but I don't know. And that's kind of the point. A forum post by Shidoshi reads, Here's my thing. I look back through my life at who I was, the things that I've done, and the mistakes I've made. As I've gotten older, I've changed, I've mellowed on a lot of things, and I'm not the same person that I used to be. Did Dave do some things that I thought were really screwed up back when we both worked at GameFan? Absolutely. But I also did some damn stupid stuff myself. I also know how easy it is to form an opinion on somebody based on pieces of information gained from here or there. There are so many opinions floating around about me that it's crazy. I look at what's been said about me, look at all the misconceptions various people have about me, and it forces me to rethink the way I look at other people. Was he a hack? A passionate journalist? Was he paid off or did he just have no taste? Was he a furry? A con artist? A father and husband? A trailblazer? Bigot? Artist? Is he even alive? Whatever he is, and whatever he was, I don't think anyone would say that he wasn't a diehard. Slap! Slap. Here, comes Here comes a daredevil! A daredevil. Get over! over. Hey, uh, it's me, Tygen, from my lair. Uh, I figured I would just provide a little bit of uh, post uh, uh, retrospect on this this whole series. <laughs> this was a documentary series that uh, I had been planning to do for a really long time. There's actually uh, the the prequel, The Girls of Gaming. I guess you could say it's like a it's almost like an in media res. <laughs> for this series. I decided not to include it because I just couldn't really figure out um, where to place it, but if you're curious uh, it'll be like linked and everything. Uh, but ever since I did research for that video and I, I found out about Dave, I'd, I'd always uh, envisioned this... Uh, <laughs> I'd envisioned it as, as... I always had it in my notes as a Dave Halverson video. Singular. Just, just one. And then once I started delving into uh, the research for just what ended up <laughs> the, the that initial plunge of research ended up becoming the first three actually kind of the the, the first three parts of this series um, as a whole and like the skeleton of parts four and five so uh, it ended up being much bigger than I anticipated, uh, but I'm glad that uh, I'm glad that I, I went through with it. It's just it's I'd been thinking about it when I started work on the first part. I'd been thinking about it for for at least half a year at that point. Um, I also did the first part while I was like still partly recovering from COVID, <laughs> so that was fun. <laughs> um, uh, but I'm really happy with how everything turned out, and I'd always wanted to put it together into like a little um, director's cut. And and for the most part, I'm I'm pretty happy with the way that everything uh, ended up being. But I did want to also use this as an opportunity to uh, go back and just make a couple minor tweaks. Nothing really to the script in terms of content, just a few small corrections and and editing fixes, and well, a couple little touches. So I'm glad I was able to do that. Uh, thank you, everyone who uh, supported this series and was was into it. Uh, this was the first series that I did, or, or the first videos that I did, uh, getting money for them uh, with my with my Patreon. So uh, I decided to leave uh, those people in uh, this compilation, this director's cut. <laughs> uh, 
just uh, to shout out the people who supported it uh, from from the jump. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I I'd almost consider doing like a follow up Q and A uh, <laughs> on this this series. Uh, I didn't quite get enough questions for that, but I'd be totally willing to because this this story was literally my life for like three months. It was to the point where I I could look at uh, certain quotes and I would just know who said them like from this absolute avalanche of forum threads that was compiled by the wonderful John Shapaniak so uh, <laughs> I was thoroughly embedded in this story <laughs> um, for for a while I've, I no joke I put more work into these five videos than I think I did anything in like my entire like 12 years of, of schooling <laughs> from like preschool to uh through high school <laughs> so uh you better have freaking enjoyed it <laughs> you probably did if you watched this far um uh yeah so i guess if i had any kind of closing thoughts i would say um i kind of always intended that you come out of this with the ability to kind of make your own your own, come to your own conclusion about who Dave Halverson was now that he's just kind of vanished. And I also implore you to not go and like track anyone down, especially him. He is, uh, he's very private. I really couldn't find very much information on him post like 2010. He has no social media. He, I, I couldn't, I couldn't find anything on the surface level, no like Facebook or anything even. So he seems like he wants to remain private assuming he's still alive i couldn't quite confirm that he was dead <laughs> so um do not try to like contact him I, I think he wants to be to be a private person i totally respect that um if anything i want this series to just serve as like a interesting well first of all an interesting story but two kind of like a uh, like a real life character study if you will and and that was that was my goal that you come away from this with uh having made your own conclusion i th I, I hope that i presented it in as neutral a way as possible even though i do rag on him <laughs> quite a bit because i mean he did do the things he did right but you know at the end of the day he's a person and people are complicated and our relationships with them are complicated. Just because some people who worked with him hate his guts doesn't mean that, like, <laughs> uh, he's just this evil uh, villain monster. I mean, you know, there's people who worked with him or who have forgiven him or have a much softer interpretation of him. And I think that's perfectly valid, and you should you should uh, consider those people's thoughts just as much as, as the people on the other side of the fence. Also, a lot of this stuff happened, like, over... 30 years ago at this point. Um, uh, so, <laughs> I hope you enjoyed. I hope this was, was interesting and, and funny and crazy. Uh, and uh, I don't know if I'll do anything quite this long in the future, uh, but it was, a, it was a lot of fun. So thank you very much for watching. Uh, I have nothing else to say. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs>